Thank you very much, Martin. This was quite a overview. I think we still should try to have this interaction between you and Martin, which a question and answer section, uh, session involves. Now, in order to facilitate the mics and so on and so forth, I'm going to start from over here and then sort of move this way. And um, if you just briefly say who you are and then state your question, try to be succinct uh, with, with sort of a, a view to time. So who wants to start? Okay, up front. Thanks so much for such a fantastic journey through history. Um, I am Amelia Santos from ONTAC, Geneva, an ex wider staff. Um, my question is about trade and poverty, uh, which uh, is my area of work. And I uh, basically, if we look at the work of economic historians like Peter Linder, Williamson, as you, as you mentioned, uh, we can see that the current economic order has been in the making for over 200 years. And still the same questions remain, whether it's uh, the, the patterns of poverty are, is, are explained by the specializations and volatility in the terms of trade, or whether we should focus on, on the structure of policies, ex ante and ex post. So do we, do we have to look at a balance here between policy, the policy making and the specialization patterns, or is one of the two that overweights uh, or outweighs the, the other? What are the two? Well, basically, the policy making, yeah. whether it's it protectionist or whether it's the pattern of specialization and then affecting countries' terms of trade, for example. That's what, uh, let's say, economic historians are arguing now. Mm -hmm. Actually, maybe since we don't have a lot of time, we could collect a bunch of questions. It's, it, uh, I'm okay. just worried that um, that one was going to take me okay. quite a while. Sure, okay. But Tony, you indicated? Um, Tony Addison from uh, WIDA. Um, this is fascinating um, material. A, a brief question, though, is, 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 is does history show that ultimately, and I use the word ultimately, democratization is essential to meaningful poverty reduction? Mm -hmm. I think this is particularly relevant for Africa. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else here on this side? Okay, there's one hand down there, yeah. Uh, Alan Thomas from the IMF. Um, one question, uh, Professor Valian, on your protection and promotion policies. You know, given there are budget constraints in the world, let's suppose, which is something we've been thinking a little bit about, if you have to choose between, let's say, a cash transfer and fertilizer subsidies, you know, you can't sort of do them both on a wide scale. Um, you know, given your background, how would you sort of think about Making that uh, making that choice. Given one, of course, is the is the first one, and the second one is sort of more in the promotion side. Okay. Anybody else here? Here. In this. Okay. Yeah. One there. Yeah, I'm Daryl Sequera, um, environmental consultant. Um, concerning the uh, history of poverty. Um, I wondered if you could go also consider the two uh, Mughal emperors in India, Akbar the Great and Ashoka. Um, offhand, I can't tell you the details, but I know that one of them, for example, had instituted uh, controls through, through his own officials of uh, the distribution of irrigation water. Mm. And that ensured that people didn't starve, or there weren't sections of the population that starved for example, and there are other accounts of how he managed. So at that time, maybe you could say that if you sought the American dream, go to Akbar's kingdom or Ashoka's kingdom and not to Sweden. Um, the other aspect is that it seems as if you've just glossed over the question of Africa. And one hypothesis here can be that poverty started in Africa at, uh, at the time of colonization in sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, and Western Africa, at a time of colonization. Because if you look at the traditional African societies, although they had kingdoms and so on, uh, there was a, a, a kind of um, social agreement among the different age groups and so on to share 
essential requirements such as food, land for cultivation, etc. Uh, and in that way I believe that uh, there was a, a certain amount of um, equality and egalitarianism, although this is, might not be actually recorded. So these are the two uh, uh, thoughts that I might introduce here. Thank you very much. Okay, anybody else in this center? Okay, Martin, you want to take a turn on this? Um, sure. Uh, put on your mic, please. I think it's still on. Uh, I have a, this one. Um, it's still on, yep. Um, I, I, don't, you know, I don't have a strong position on, the, on the, your, your, uh, Amelia's question on, on trade. Um, I don't know that you mean Peter Linder, but it's more um, Jeff Williamson, but, but um, I don't think Peter has a view on this. But, um, and, and um, you know, I, I guess I'm, I, I don't, I've never thought, I, I, I'm not one of those who thinks trade policy is the most important thing in development and so on, and a country comparative advantage and ability. I, I'm, I'm, just not, I'm sympathetic, but I'm not... Um, I, I tend to think that there are deeper, deeper problems than to which, uh, to which trade policy is endogenous. I'm, I'm not particularly fond of protectionism. I'm not so pretty sceptical of most efforts in that area and in industrial policy, direct interventions for industrial policy rather than indirect for, uh, forms of intervention. I tend to be fairly um, unsympathetic, but um, um, I hear people like Justin Lin arguing these, uh, making quite sensible arguments. Uh, against my views on that, and I remain uh, um, open. I think the the point I would make, you know, with trade policy, industrial policy, it's it's you know, I, th I think just don't be ideological about those sorts of policies. I mean, you just look at what works and what doesn't in particular contexts. Uh, trade policy is a huge horizontal impacts that we largely ignore uh, to our peril. Horizontal impacts meaning you're not hearing. Well, it is on. Okay, I'll, I'll use this one. Um, that um, I won't repeat because I don't have time, but um, sorry. The, the trade policy is, um, there are uh, huge horizontal issues in trade policy we tend not to ignore, uh, we tend to ignore. Um, and I, yeah, I don't, um, I don't have a strong view on that. Um, Tony's point about democratization, I have a stronger view on that. Um, I don't think, I don't think classic electoral democracy is all that important to poverty reduction as a generalization. And the reason is I've got, you've got so much. What, what's the country that has had the most success against, against poverty in human history? It's obviously China. Well, um, but I emphasize electoral democracy. When I compare China and India, um, you know, I, I've often asked myself, in working in villages in both countries in different times, where I'd, if I was in classic Hindu style, if I was reborn, would I rather be in an Indian village or a Chinese village? And my answer is, well, not knowing which village we're talking about, I'm just randomly placed in a village in one of the two countries. You better to be a Chinese village because I'd be freer. Despite the fact that, uh, that India is a robust electoral democracy. In the classic, in most in the Indian villages I know, I'd feel quite unfree. In the Chinese villages I know, I'd be protesting, I'd be asserting my rights. So it's, it's the, 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 there are a lot of nuances here in what we mean by democracy. The importance of being able to assert your rights, the importance of political voice, totally agree. But the form that takes and how it's articulated and whether it involves electoral democracy, well, I'm open to that. I think that evolves in time and in places. I think it also can be... Um, a problem at other times, in other places. Um, you know, cash transfers versus fertilizer subsidy. I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you which is better, obviously. I mean, we can think about evaluation. We know about the tools of evaluation. That's an, that's an answerable question by, by standard uh, methods of economic analysis. We'd look at uh, the costs and benefits and how they're distributed of each policy. Uh, but as a little comment, I, I wouldn't think about conditional cash transfers as purely being protection. Additional cash transfers of both protection and promotion. And you look at the new wave of uh, progressive social policies in developing countries, they all have that feature. They try to combine protection and promotion. Um, now, if we're talking, it also depends where we're talking about, obviously. Fertilizer subsidies in India, I'm not in. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'd be really hard, you'd have, from what I know, it'd be hard to convince me and many people that 
fertilizer subsidies in India are a real great, a great idea from the point of view of poverty reduction and certainly power subsidies, which totally dwarf fertilizer subsidies. I'd argue there are better ways to spend that money. But if we're talking about, say, Malawi in Africa, I could give you a different answer. Um, the co comments about colonialization, we, I've heard those arguments, I find them so passe about, uh, about colonialization causing all these problems in Africa and uh, I, I think it's a much more complex reading of history. Um, I, 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 the African sharing economy seems to be going, surviving well. I, in Africa today, a classic, I mean, I'm generalizing across 52 countries or something, but I, you still hear repeatedly about the importance of the, the sharing economy, the fact that uh, if you, if you, uh, people will hide their money to rather than share it because otherwise they will have to share it with their friends and relatives. Those things in, in African culture are still mm, throughout the subcontinent, not everywhere, but they're still there. So clearly colonialization, post-colonial society didn't get rid of them. Uh, they, they, they seem to persist despite colonialization, despite uh, independence. Okay, so now we move over to this side. Uh, there was one in the middle of Ma, I think. Yeah, and then one just in front. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Martin, for a wonderful paper. Um, I just have one question, and whether from your reading it seems that it's only when the elite realizes that they need to stamp out poverty that you're going to have anti-poverty measures put in place. And I'm thinking here of the paper that Deswan wrote in the mid-60s, about the movement towards a welfare state. And then on the base of that paper, Elisa Rice, who looked at elite in Brazil and South Africa, my own country, I'm from South Africa, and saying that the elite actually see the dangers from poverty only in individual terms, in terms of crime and so forth, and not so much in terms of riots and revolutions. Thank you. Just in front, yeah. Yeah, my name is Philip Baumgartner from the Center for Development Research in Bonn. Thanks for the, for the presentation, and I enjoyed it um, as an economist to be taught about the last uh, 300 years of what we are trying to do today. Um, I think that's very insightful. My question goes to um, towards solutions for Africa. Um, you highlighted that East Asia has been quite successful in the sequencing of some of their policy measures. And then in your concluding slide, you said, okay, what we can do is technology, knowledge, and social, like a political voice. Um, how would you sequence those for Africa? Okay, Surab, yeah, in the front. Thank you. Uh, my name is S. Subramanian from the Madras Institute of Development Studies in India. This was an extremely instructive review. Uh, I'll just make a couple of very quick observations on the on possible gaps in the literature, which you're probably familiar with, but in case you haven't addressed yourself to it. In the late 18th century, uh, Tom Paine's book, Rights of Man, contains a fairly remarkable section on anti-poverty policy and social security, going into the minutiae of uh, old age pension and uh, 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 redressing undernutrition among children, special provisions for widows and uh, uh, unwed mothers, uh, schooling. And he also has an extraordinarily detailed scheme of redistributive taxation. He speaks of direct taxation, in particular of land revenue. And it's interesting that the highest marginal rate which he prescribes is 100%. So uh, I think Tom Paine's early work is of extremely crucial interest in the context of what you've dealt with. <laughs> Secondly, on the other America, uh, I think a fine piece of work which deserves mention is James Agee's book, uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, which as recently as the late 1930s was actually banned when it was uh, published before it went on, as often happens in these cases, to become a classic. Now that's just with respect to the literature. At a more substantive level, the notion of poverty and of anti-poverty policy that you've invoked seems largely to be concerned with poverty as a matter of domestic concern. Whereas I believe we all know that uh, the role which has been played in the poverty of nations by such global phenomena as colonialism and unfair trade practices and strife and debt and uh, uh, the vagaries and inadequacies of international aid and structural adjustment and so on, uh, 
we, which, which is the sort of stuff which people like Thomas Poge have uh, 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 concentrated on a great deal, uh, is, is, isn't it worth reviewing uh, the whole question of poverty from, from these perspectives rather than to, because where England was, was placed in the late 19th century uh, is surely not where, say, India was placed in the mid-1950s because uh, England did not inherit a system of colonialism, whereas India did. And, and colonialism in one form or the other of, of, of economic imperialism continues to be a dominant reality of the world in which we live. So an account of poverty and anti-poverty policy which doesn't quite take stock of these global phenomena would appear to be curiously, uh, for want of a better word, and since I'm in a hurry, shall, shall we say deficient. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yus. Um, Anybody else on this side? Eric? No? Okay. Martin? Sure. Well, thank you for the, the comments, and thank you for the early set of comments, too. Um, the, the role of the elites. Um, I don't think it, you could... I'm not, certainly not saying that this was just a matter of what the elites decided was possible. It's also a matter of the, the elites are heterogeneous, and they're forming coalitions between uh, across classes was actually crucial to this. And, uh, those coalitions uh, took a long time to form in, uh, around um, progressive anti-poverty policies, but they, they did form. Um, and the, the constraints on the elites that emerged out of a political voice for poor people were hugely important to this process. Um, so I don't quite see it in those terms. But um, there's more we could say on that, but it's, we don't have a lot of time. But um, the, your question about the sequencing your question about sequencing, that's a, that's a nice question. I don't have a, a clear answer to that. Um, I think the sequencing of technical progress, knowledge and voice, knowledge and voice, the, the, I think technical progress was actually crucial. I'd say that, that it's hard to imagine getting very far on the other two without, um, without the conditions being right for technical progress. But so on the, on the other two, I think the historical sequencing has been um, no, probably technical progress, voice and knowledge at the same time. In terms of what, instead of history, what should happen, uh, I have no view. Um, uh, thanks, um, Subramanian, for the references. Um, uh, I, know, I think I know Tom Payne, but I'm not, I'll go back to it. I wasn't sure what the other one, but you can tell me later, James, someone or other. But, um, I, I, uh, it's, not a deli it's not an accidental, and I hope not superficial, omission on my part. I'm just not very sympathetic with any of those arguments, frankly. Uh, I think they've been arguments that have been brought out to blame uh, poor countries for staying poor, blaming um, imperialism, blaming colonialism. Um, I, I, in a lot of years working in development, I've just come to the conclusion that so much depends on what countries do for themselves in particular settings, and, and I'd say that was definitely true in India. Um, I, I think there's just there's a bit of truth, of course, and obviously there are constraints coming from the external sector, no question, no doubt about that. But I'm, I'm quite, become quite impatient with the arguments of uh, uh, blaming domestic policy failures on uh, imperialism, colonialism, and whatever. I, I, I just... And going back to the earlier question, it's a, I think it's not. It's a, it's a lazy answer, frankly. I think there's so many dimensions and so much policy space for the domestic arena that that I, I think um, I'm drawn away from those types of explanations. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the questions, and uh, Martin. Thank you very much for getting us off to a good start. We will have two days where we can discuss all of those policies that we can actually suggest that countries and governments might want to pursue. Um, I would like to say that uh, since we are exactly 10 minutes late, we will start the next session at 11.10, okay? And then we will basically take 10 minutes off the lunch break. So please reconvene in the relevant sessions at 10 past 11. And thank you very much, Martin.